rock itself is kind of about the halfway point. Um, so, right. Any questions before we get going? Yeah, it's growing up summer sweet or spice bush, and it's um, the pollinators love it. Um, but it was also used to make soap um, back in colonial history, the, the root and bark of it. But um, these days, the big thing happening, this is a birch tree, a little baby birch. And um, there's a disease that's um, hitting that starts on the underside of the leaves. And we'll see a couple of them up here, but it causes them to start to get limp like this. And then they get a little discolored. They'll get some, usually some bands of dark across them. But uh, one of the people we've been out here with is used to be the uh, forester for Providence, Doug Still, who's doing, started a, in his retirement now, he started kind of a tree organization. But uh, Doug was saying that this is really happening all up and down the East Coast, and you know, we, kind of, we can expect a really big die off of the beach and the forests, um, and they don't really have any way to um, deal with it in big numbers. You can take care of one tree, but it's not something that's not an obvious solution. So, um, yeah, I've kind of been watching that happen out here. So. That's all glacial leavings. Um, the Laurentide Glacier that came through about 12,000 years ago left these big fingers of um, rock that are really just debris and mud that were really compressed under huge pressure. And these spines of rock are about every quarter mile, third of a mile apart, running north and south. And there's about a half dozen or eight of them um, that really make feed right down into the Kikamewit, at the top of the Kikamewit. And if you mm -hmm. want to start understanding the ecology, and actually a lot of the human history of this area, it's really, I think a lot of it starts with just those spines really defining where the water goes, what's a good place to be, a bad place to be, where things grow, um, with the different animals like, you know, so. Um, you can just kind of make it out over there yeah. and see a little more of it here, but we'll see a couple of others of those spines. And the fun part, like if you're out, out here with kids, um, I like to have the kids think about it as these are almost like dragons going underground and then coming back up. Mm. Because the way the spines go is they're not just parallel, there'll be one that goes underground and one that comes up, and then this one comes up and this one goes down. <laughs> so they kind of, you know, you can, if you have a vivid imagination, you can start to think of them as moving. A ballpark of 125 oh years old, um, which gives you a way of imagining that this was all cleared land and used as a part of a bigger um, dairy farm, probably until about 100, 125 wow. years ago. And then as they scaled back, this started to grow back in. And, um, this is what, what there is now. Hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's isn't it? This, um, area out here, you're welcome to go out and take a peek or we can all go out and take a look. This is uh, what's left of the D'Alessandro farm. You can see some of the buildings on um, 136 just up here. And if um, you go out to this field and look up, you can see that 136 is built up on a, probably 30 feet above this farm field. And that's another one of those ridges that we were just talking about. You know, kind of go from the Warren River all the way over um, to the east here. Um, but there's only about 80 acres of this land left, and they sold off a bunch of it for a little development, a little housing development. And um, Mr. D'Alessandro died, must be going on 10 years ago now, eight years ago. Um, and his kids are not farmers, and they're not sure what they're going to do with it. So it's also uh, another small farm that's just kind of in limbo. And um, it's pretty marginal land. So what you would do to make a living on 88 acres of this kind of land is a little open to um, speculation as well. Um, I think there's some things that could work that would take a lot of investment. And that's um, Swansea now, right? Yeah, we crossed into um, Swansea when we crossed that little stream, that little pond. That's the, the boundary. Yep. We're oh. yep, very much in Swansea now. Yeah, we can go up and take a quick look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. yeah, it's hard to see through the trees with the yeah. sun as it is, but there's another ridge right there. In the south end of that ridge is where Margaret Throckers will be at in just a minute. Um, Four Town Farm is um, farming this right now. Um, they've been really, really late getting their crops in this year just because of the weather. It's just been all kinds of problems um, for doing it. But a lot of deer, a lot of turkey. Um, where we are right now, we're going to walk uh, you know, a couple hundred yards over to the east here and we'll be at Margaret's Rock. Um, but before we get there, this little spot where we are I think is um, important um, as a part of the history of Margaret's Rock. So imagine the uh, Poconaca tribe that was here. This Margaret's Rock was, we think, um, the stories are that it was one of the winter encampments of the Poconaca and probably not every winter but you know pretty regularly and they had been in, been here for probably between eight and ten thousand years so they came just after the glacier receded they arrived and they had inhabited this area with uh, usually um, camps of 100 to 150 people kind of sprinkled throughout this area the Solomon's area and um, <coughs> The Poconaca were one of a coalition of five tribes and they considered themselves even now the historically the leadership tribe and there's um, and together they were collectively in modern history called the Wampanoag but it's not what they how they refer to themselves. Um, their um, enemy um, but pretty low key for the most part was historically was the Narragansett and there was just kind of boundary disputes and a little pushing and shoving, but they mostly um, disliked each other and put up with each other, kind of. Um, then, um, sort of fast forward to the um, early 1600s and 1619 ish, um, it brought with it some sort of a disease. The best guess is leptospirosis. Um, and that spread like wildfire through the native community and the estimates are that um, depending where you were sort of between Cape Cod down to here um, between 40 and 80 percent of the population died within a year or two um, so it just went like just raced through these communities and um, part of the reason we want to be here is if we just look you look over in this area of the, the folklore and it's never been substantiated with um, physical evidence. But the folklore is that this was the burial area for the um, Poconocket going back, you know, hundreds of years, but also um, probably for a lot of the um, that epidemic that went through. Um, <clears throat> so, what I think, you know, as a cultural historian, what I what I've imagined is, um, and this was really poignant in the context of the pandemic that we're just kind of coming out of now, um, try to imagine being part of a community where 80% of randomly, um, starting with young children and the elderly, but randomly 80% of your community died within 18 months. Um, and I try to think about the impact of that on a lot of cultural traditions and belief systems and practices. And I have to think that the deaths were so extreme, the number of them were so extreme that um, you just simply couldn't keep up with regular burials. And then imagine being a survivor of that and kind of carrying that trauma and that history with you as you tried to rebuild, rebuild things. And um, that's a really, really important context to be thinking about the arrival of the pilgrims in Plymouth Colony and why they were met the way they were by the local tribes. Um, it was largely because um, the Poconocket were afraid that in their weakened condition, the Narragansett would take advantage and shove them off their land or you know, harm them in other ways. And so they rightly um, concluded that an alliance with these European arrivals was a way to protect themselves from Narragansett encroachment. So, you know, it was kind of so they marched up to Plymouth and said, "Hi, you know, we're here to we're here to help, but we expect a few things in return." 
And that's the context that Roger Williams um, was walking into. And he had met um, the Poconocket prior to leaving um, and coming down here permanently. Um, so there was all this sort of prior um, relationship and trading, but particularly political um, alliances that had been made. But um, so I. There's usually people want to know if there's been any archaeologists out here, and uh, there have been once or twice, um, pretty very gently, and they haven't found anything. I think it's pretty unlikely that they would find very much, um, given the ways that burials happened and how long ago. I mean, we're talking the most recent would have been 400 years ago, mm. so um, chances of anything organic still being there to be found are pretty pretty slim. Um, <coughs> But I think the general consensus has also been that nobody wants a real serious inquiry because it's just would be pretty disrespectful um, to the people who are still here. So, what's um, the evidence that it was here? What, um, why do people suspect? Uh, the Poconaca history. They still they have a tribal historian who has an oral history that is recalled, and um, I have every reason to think it's accurate. I mean, I'm sure there are other interpretations or things outside of it that matter, but you know, it seems very yeah. continuous. There's a um, uh, 1930s historian, um, Virginia Baker, right, um, from Warren, who wrote a couple of town histories. She's quite a remarkable historian. She'd be an interesting subject in herself. And she reports that she tells this story and how far it was from Margaret's Rock and where the... But she also... Um, has been known to exaggerate a tale or two, so she's a really excellent amateur historian. I don't know how dependable she always is, but the thing to think about, though, um, you know, I've done, I do, I've done um, a lot of oral histories over the years, and the thing I always tell my students is, even if somebody isn't is telling you the wrong facts, they're still telling you a truth, right? So the thing to do is figure out why are they telling you that. And so the thing that when to think about this is it might be the case that they're actually were physically buried out in the middle of that field. But the fact is that this percentage of this tribe that lived here was buried somewhere right here. So we can assign it to that place and it gives us something to look at and reflect on. But um, the historic fact of it is can be a little bit different than the actual physical location. So The, the fact that they weren't just afraid when that another ship full of white people arrived because did they kn did they know that the disease that the former well, I ship think it, brought was no from the white because men? I think you know the, I don't think there would have been a concept of communicable disease okay. in the way that we understand okay. it then um, you know that people could bring things that were dangerous that changed your lives for sure but the actual transmission mechanism I don't think would have been understood. Yeah. Yeah. And it wouldn't fit into the sort of, um, we're going to give you blankets infected with smallpox deliberately. This was probably um, members of the crew who had it, but had grown up in a European environment where they had some resistance. So they were sick, but not deathly sick. And it hit a, a new population that had no resistance at all, and it just decimated them. So, so there would have, might not have even been uh, a connection to make um, until later, quite a bit later. The, um, you know, we're walking through these woods, they're gorgeous, very peaceful, and we think, boy, this is nature, and the highway is not. I mean, obviously that's like violence you know, to, to the natural world. But on the other hand, um, if the Poconocket were here for 8,000 years, they probably managed this land for 7,000 of those years, figured out, and that would have meant um, regular burns through it to keep mm -hmm. the undergrowth out, um, the preference for certain species of trees over others, for um, certain kinds of berries over others, um, the movement between the Warren River, which would have been full of shellfish and fish um, for s seasonal use up to here, and as David mentioned, you know, um, farming techniques, sort of the three sisters that you probably have heard of, of mm -hmm. you know, corn and beans and um, squashed together and um, that probably was not done in one field permanently but probably rotated through because 
of um, people just didn't know about compost and other ways of maintaining soil, so they would use it close to wear it out, move, and then kind of cycle back through um, eventually to, you know, as it had re rebuilt itself a little bit. Um, so what we're actually in the middle of is not a natural environment, but unless you consider humans part of nature, which I do. Um, so, you know, but humans had a huge impact on the way that this landscape, you know, like the trees that we're seeing and what's here. Um, yeah. All right, well, let's walk up and um, see how this rocks. Oh, I'm here. <coughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah, so this is Margaret's Rock, um, and um, the in most of the mainstream histories, what makes it memorable is that in 1636, uh, Roger Williams was driven out of um, Massachusetts and ended up down here. And it was February, middle of the winter. He escaped, left his wife and children behind, and um, showed up here and came. He had pneumonia um, or some sort of respiratory illness, probably pneumonia, and was really seriously ill. And um, Usa Maiklin, who was the sachem, and his wife Margaret and the other uh, tribal members who were here for the winter um, nursed him back to health over a month or six weeks. And once he was healthy, some of his other allies from Massachusetts had come down and met him, and they made their way down to Prov what's now Providence and started the process of founding Providence. So the um, part of one thing to think of is without the um, hospitality of the people here when he arrived, we would not have Providence in the shape that we currently know it. Um, this uh, little sign here was erected by the Roger Williams uh, Family Association, and they're the heirs of Roger Williams who identify themselves partly by their connection to him. And um, I'm appreciative that there's some sort of sign here, and um, I also, as a historian, cringe every time I look at it because it's just riddled with errors and, I think, misrepresentations. Hard to um, read. <laughs> yeah, and it's gotten the, the black is worn out of it. Um, here by tradition, uh, the Massasoit and Margaret, Margaret and the um, Wampanoag nursed an ill Roger back to health during that very cold winter of 1636 um, after his banishment from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And, you know, the issues with it are, I think, that, you know, think of this as a home place for 8,000 years, and it's now Roger Williams' shelter. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's sort of just... Like, this isn't Roger Williams' shelter. He was sheltered here, but it wasn't his. his. shelter. <laughs> um, and it's, um, it says the chief Massasoit, and Massasoit is the, Wampan, uh, the uh, Pokanakan word for um, chief. So it's basically saying chief, chief. chief. <laughs> so his name was Usamequin, and um, the uh, Massasoit was his honorary title as the leader of this tribe. So, um, you know, it's mostly just they don't know the history, so I don't want to judge them harshly, but, but yeah. if you're going to claim a memorial, um, I think there's, there's also this idea that this is ancient history, um, and the Poconocket are still here, and the Mashpee are still here, and, you know, so on. So um, it's just a unintentionally kind of disrespectful, um, I guess is how I would frame it. Um, I wouldn't want this taken out. Um, I've talked with the um, Roger Williams Association about it a couple of times, but I would think that ideally somebody like uh, Dave's organization, the Soames Heritage Group, would 
put up an additional sign or make available more information that sort of flush mm -hmm. this out and um, let people understand it. The apocryphal history is that when uh, Roger Williams showed up, he was nursed back to health right in this little alcove, start a nice fire in there, put a little bit of a lean-to against it, and you could have a pretty cozy spot. I've been out here, I walk out here probably 360 days a year. Um, and I've been out in every kind of weather, including um, times when we've had two or three foot snowfalls and some really big drifts. And what's fascinating about this location is that this little bit of a rise right here in the orientation of this wing means that there's never any snow past this line right here. It's always dry. And when there's rain, um, it's this overhang used to come out a bit further is um, most likely, but um, it actually is a pretty good protection for most of the northeast or northwest storms that would come through. And if it comes from the south, um, either direction, southeast or southwest, there's this hill itself in the you know, landscape to kind of protect. So it's an incredibly um, smart place to set up. Um, it w would have looked back then Something well, let, like let's it? take a we'll take a walk if you're up for it, just up along the side of this because this let's just we'll just walk up yeah. there and take it. It's one of those long spines. It probably runs a third of a mile north and south before it dives back underground at either end. And um, our best guess, my best guess, um, and the tribal historian has been out. Um, Jamie Warren, who I mentioned, another historian has been out. Um, other folks that would know a little bit about this. We're kind of all agreed, but we again, we don't have any physical evidence, so it's speculation to some degree. But the best guess is that the actual encampment itself would have been set up along this little bench right here. So the top of this ridge is right there, drops down about 15 or 20 feet, flat bench, flattish bench, it widens a little bit as you go back and then it drops off another 10 or 15 feet. So if you think about it from both uh, um, protection from the weather point of view in the winter, almost all the bad weather comes out of the Northwest. This is huge protection from that. So, and you have access to water and wood and all the other things you'd want, food. Um, and then the other thing that's a big advantage here, um, and this was Jamie Warren's contribution, is that this is an easily defensible site because you're up high you can with minimal effort you can uh, see or hear people coming you are up on high ground and you have it be the way it's actually designed the steep part at the top is makes it easier to defend rather than more difficult so um, this would have been a really just a really smart place to be you're protected from the weather you have access to the resources you need and it's defensible and so the best guess is people were here um, lived in um, collective wigwams or uh, long sort of look, looks kind of like these wiki ups or we twos um, and this is this is um, Ruth's best guess of what this strip would have looked like when it had a group of 150 people or so living yeah. here so it's kind of oriented this is the tip down there and kind of heading back so yeah, so you can, um, we don't have to today, but if you go up on this ridge, it's getting a little overgrown up there now. There is a trail, that animal trail, deer trail, that goes across the top of it, and you can see down into the Dallas Andro farm um, below. It's in, uh, sunsets are really gorgeous from up there. So, I bet they are. Yeah, so it. Roger Williams, I mean, this was <laughs> an established uh, winter settlement, so he knew he was coming here, and it would have He had a prior relationship a with... Um, Usamequin and um, probably the entire tribe, um, both for political reasons and trade. And so, you know, there was a lot of interchange. And the thing that that really begins to open up is that we think of, often people think of this part of Native American history as being really static. And instead, what you get start to get a sense of is how ordinarily human all of their relationships were so very political very um, hospitable very much interested in trade and so all of these networks of relationships 
Um, one thing that I think is really uh, profoundly different about that conceptualization of the world compared to the European, particularly the English conceptualization though, is that um, Europeans invented this idea of land ownership. And um, there's, so there's all these myths, um, folklores in Western history about Indians being tricked into selling Manhattan for a bunch of beads. What actually was happening and what happened around here is that the tribe did not have a concept of ownership of the land. They were part of it. What they did have was the idea that um, land was a bundle of rights. That makes sense. So if I want to come and hunt deer here, that's a right that can be negotiated. You know, you, I, I, I'm here, you want to visit and hunt deer. Okay, but it's um, going to cost you something. Yeah. And that cost might be symbolic in an alliance. So you're going to give me some beads or wampum or something like that. But it, or it could be, I get to go to your land and harvest berries or something. So um, really complex, right? And mm. people traveling tens and hundreds of miles to do some of these, these things. Um, so what the native population, including the Poconaga here, I, I believe, thought they were doing for the most part was actually negotiating use rights, usage rights with Europeans. Mm -hmm. What Europeans, I think Roger Williams understood that and actually tried to honor it, but um, despite the stories about him being Superman, he kind of lost politically um, right about the time of King Philip's War when um, other European forces, colonial forces, that wanted to take land from by force from the native population succeeded in doing that. And they did it, the justifications are pretty um, well known. The land was empty, it was underused, this wasn't a real culture um, by European standards. So all these sorts of after the fact justifications that popped up simply to make it sound okay that we just took, took people's land. But what was really in conflict, I believe, is a fundamentally different worldview about human relationship to place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's one of the things I'm really fascinated in, because we know historians have sort of described the broad history of that in a lot of the language, but I've never seen any real accounting for what were the, what was the moments in British law when those usufruct rights got translated into ownership rights. You know, there has to be some moment legally when that happened. And I, I, a presentation by the, somebody at the Schumacher Institute of just that. I think it's, it was George Monibo. Yes, I, I saw it. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's just, it's so fascinating. And yeah, somebody's yeah. going to come up with it. I, I, I'd like it to be me, but I don't think it will be. Right. But uh, yeah, somebody like George. Yeah, there must have been historical moments that were significant. Yeah. 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 And it's sort of, yeah, we could, I could go down that rabbit hole with people too. But, um, so the, the other thing that um, really starts to make this site significant is that um, in 1674-5, the, um, one of Usamequin's sons, um, Philip by his European name, um, had emerged into leadership of the tribe and had, unlike his father, decided that a treaty relationship with the British was not the best way forward for um, what was left of their people because this land was being encroached on and the numbers of Europeans arriving was increasing and their attitude towards the native people was changing pretty, pretty noticeably. So he decided to try to create a collective movement of all the tribes in the area and push the British out and this will sound like a reach maybe, but um, I've been trying really hard to understand what Putin thinks he's doing in Ukraine because it's just sort of boggles the imagination. But one explanation that I've heard is that Russia is facing a demographic and economic transformation in the next 10 to 15 years where if he, they waited 10 more years, they would not be able to field an army large enough to take Ukraine back, if you believe in the, was part of Russia. In other words, their population is aging so fast, they won't have enough young people to make up an army capable of doing those things. So um, I don't think it's any logical justification, but it's, uh, but it's a justification. We do it now or we can't do it. And I can imagine that that's sort of how um, Philip was feeling um, 
1675. And so this wasn't the place where the actual physical conflict began, like this specific location, but it took, it happened around here. Um, the different sides chose to see each other in the worst light instead of the best light. Things began to um, turn into physical, direct, violent con conflict. And over the course of a year, year and a half, um, you know, it went up as far as what's now northwestern Massachusetts, um, kind of down through this region. And uh, the best estimates are that about half of the native population, the remaining na native population, so think 1619, we just lost 40 to 80 percent. Now, um, 1675, we just less, lost half of the remaining native population. Um, and probably about a quarter of the British, um, of the colonial settlers as well, it was uh, per capita the bloodiest war in the United S history of, of the United States. So really, really violent um, mm -hmm. time to be here. But um, the tribe Pocanaca lost, and um, there were a series of consequences for them, one of which is that their culture was outlawed. It was, you were forbidden to speak um, the language, practice any of the customs, um, inhabit regular places. And so the surviving Poconocket and Narragansett and other tribes as well who had joined in, but the surviving Poconocket um, were essentially uh, made invisible. And they either escaped um, up to what's now southern Maine with the Passamaquoddy, uh, for example, or they were uh, caught up and then, like a lot of the Narragansett um, uh, survivors, sent as slaves down into the Caribbean, right? So there's this very um, genocidal moment for the Poconocket. And to be out here with the survivors these days saying, oh, we're still here, like, you know, we, a huge part of their narrative is survival. There's a um, Native American writer named Jerry Visner, who was a mentor of mine that I met in graduate school, who coined a term survivance. And it's a combination of survival and resistance. And he argues that for a lot of um, tribes that have been through those kinds of experiences, this combination of survival, no matter what, and resistance in the sense of keeping my culture even when I'm not allowed to, is really the dominant part of the story um, since that time. So that's 400, almost 400 years ago. Um, and so that, that's quite a... Um, humbling story to kind of just be in, but that's that's here, you know, that story part of it's right here. Yeah. You must have had allies in southern Maine too, because when we, remember when we were there on the islands, like Cushing Island off uh, sure. Portland, there, there are several islands there, and it, they said it was King Philip's War that a lot of the settlers lost their their yeah. lives in, their, yeah. their original settlers. Yeah, the war there. spread up, um, well, you know, it, it gets complicated to think about because Massachusetts Bay actually entailed a lot of what's now Maine and mm. Vermont and New Hampshire. You know, it was just like the boundary of it was massive, yeah, yeah. Right? right? But to your point, the, um, all of these political and trade alliances that had been in place for hundreds of years were really well established, and yeah. some of those tribes They must have sided with in. King yeah. Philip. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they said it was King Philip's yeah. war. But, but yeah. not all of them did, you know, right. back to the human part of it, some of the tribes would also play the different pieces off against each other for mm. what they thought was their own interest. Right. Um, the Poconocket that are here now, partly with the, um, the alliance that they, they have with um, the Soham's Heritage Group, have really made a lot of headway in being recognized by the town of Warren and in a number of public events. But um, the Mashpee, which were also part of this alliance, um, and the Aquina down in uh, Martha's Vineyard, don't want them to be recognized. From their point of view, the Poconaca were a race. They don't exist anymore. Um, they don't want them acknowledged. They particularly don't want them acknowledged by the state or federal governments because then their competition for whatever few goods are remaining. So some of the harshest native political conflicts happening right now here, you know, locally, but also nationally, are intertribal, you know, and it's, um, 
you know, excuse my editorial, but colonialism keeps, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So I'm up with the survivance, you know, it's the maintenance of interpersonal relationships, the maintenance of cultural traditions that people can hang on to and continue to practice. Um, one of the, for me, one of the most moving uh, moments coming out here with different groups was when um, some of the Pocanocket leadership came out, but um, uh, the current, the rising, the new um, sachem brought her um, son and a friend with her, and these two young guys, they're like, what, 16 years old when they came out, Dave? 17? Yeah. You know, young, young, young adults, right on the edge of being young adults. But they had um, committed themselves to being what are called panese, and uh, a P-I-N-E-S-E. Or and a Pianese. Pianese. Yeah. And um, a Pianese is uh, someone who's chosen the role and been asked to take the role of protecting the sachem in perpetuity. Like their sacred role in their life is doing that. And to do that, you need to obviously know all the history and what it is you're... So these two young guys that said, no, we're going to be the carriers of our culture going forward. Right? So, I, so you do it kind of like that. The problem is, um, again, you know, people want sort of a, a historical continuity and purity to it. And you need one little moment of disconnect or disruption for an entire history to be left behind. And then you're left scrambling, how do I put it back together, the pieces? Mm -hmm. And a lot of Native history in the U.S. is marked by these um, big erasures and breakups and then moments of trying to put together the pieces back into an idea of a Native American identity or culture or ideology. Um, and some of them are really useful and powerful and succeed and a lot of them just sort of get really eccentric and don't make it. But, um, mm. you know, uh, the most, most important one probably for recent history is there was a pan-Indian movement in the 1930s um, where a lot of tribes feeling kind of the way Philip did back in 1670, said, if we don't get our act together, we're going to disappear. We need to have a collective political and cultural presence. Mm -hmm. And that's what led in the 1970s to um, American Indian movement and a lot of other red power movements that were, you know, part of a lot of cultural movements happening. But, um, yeah, it's really the idea of, you know, maintaining this whole chain of continuity intact, I just think is not... Imagine losing 80% of your community to an epidemic. Like, how do you, what do you hang on to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, what do you do in the, the end of a war that you lost? And so it's, so I think you do the best you can and keep as much of it as you can and, you know, keep adapting. So, so got your comments, questions, stories? There's a fascinating documentary called um, The Singing Revolution. I don't know if anyone's mm -hmm. seen it. Mm -hmm. It's about yeah. Estonia, and um, it starts prior to World War II, and then talks about how they were occupied by Germany, and then uh, first Russia, then <coughs> Germany, then Russia again, and uh, then absorbed into Russia, and how Russia had this Russification program that moved in. I mean, it was a t it's a tiny country, a million mm -hmm. people maybe moved in forty thousand Russians, and then how through culture, particularly singing the Estonians were able to get their country back and really wow. established um, the path for the Baltics to cut free from Russia when uh, glasnost and mm -hmm. such happened. But it was done through their, their, their strength of family and community and their, and their, um, their singing. They, sing. they had a stage with, that accommodated 30,000 singers and 100,000 people would come every year to hear them and they would sing all of the songs and of course Russia tried to wipe that all out. They weren't allowed to sing those songs and they couldn't wear their costumes but they held on to it anyway. But that's all I could think of when you were yeah, talking yeah. about Putin and and then comparing it to what happened here and that's it's very similar to sure, what so happened. Many parallels to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you know um, Isabel Wilkerson's book um, Cast? I don't. I know. I yeah. know the warmth of other suns. I haven't. Yeah, the warmth. That. Yeah, that's an awesome book. But cast it kind of looks at three different genocides in history, um, and I think her point in one of them is slavery in the U.S. But um, 
one of the points she's making is that this is a universal his problem. You know, we, we just don't have a very good history to collectively, and we could do better. Yeah. Well, how did he end up living in a Native American tribe? Huh? Oh. This is a really gorgeous little meadow. Um, there's a little, if you go down into the woods, maybe 75 or 100 feet, there's a nice little uh, cattle pond, so a water source. So it's a great place to fence in some animals or whatever. But at the same time, you can see all this new growth that's coming in right here. Yeah. And um, this meadow, I would say even eight years ago, was probably literally almost 50% larger than it is now. Because oh. what's happening is the um, hay fields are leased out to people who hay for, for a living. And they'll come in and they don't do the careful mowing up into the edges. They just go through as fast as they can. And, and understandably, it's not a criticism of them. What that allows is that each season it encroaches just a little bit more, mm. a little bit more. And um, I like them, you know, I've kept bees for a long time. So the uh, milkweeds that are here and other things. But in, as far as pasture goes, milkweed, the sap in it is poisonous to cows and horses. Mm. So once it's dried, it, it's not toxic any longer. But um, having a meadow full of it, um, is not really ideal either. So what's happening, this looks gorgeous and it really is. And um, this spot where we are right here gets a lot of um, seed grasses that goldfinches like. So you'll come down in the fall and there'll be a hundred goldfinches. Like, it's, so it's gorgeous. But as farm, for farm usage, it's actually really deteriorating rapidly. It's just, it's not very good pasture any longer. And so the it's right at that transition point. Um, okay. So eventually, would this fill in as far as? Well, it'll fill in. Um, probably the sequence would be um, plants like this, native flowering plants, um, which are really gorgeous and a lot of fun. Some of the grasses that you were noticing before, you know, this red fescue that's right here, and sorrels and a bunch of things. Probably what would happen though is that wild roses and bittersweet would then start to encroach. And bittersweet's kind of horrible. Um, it's pretty, but it's really kills everything around it. Um, and then the evidence is pretty good though that uh, particularly the wild roses and the pricker bushes um, create a good environment for seedlings to grow up. They protect them from getting munched by other animals. Um, so you'd probably get some smaller, shorter-lived trees, you know, little pin oaks and things that you can see in the edges here, um, some black walnut and um, just sassafras, you know, like a bunch, a bunch of things that are faster growing. And then those would be succeeded by um, longer-lived oaks and white pines and things gradually. So, and as those come in, the canopy gets stronger and it starts to shade out and kill off all of the understory, or to a large degree. But that's probably a 100-year process, 150-year process. The complication right now for um, farmers wanting to use this is the it's protected as farmland, which is awesome. But if it's not maintained and it's allowed to return to forest, then you cannot clear it and reuse it as farmland. It's considered protected forest land. So it's like, a, it's kind of a use it or lose it um, yeah. policy environment right now for it. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thanks Sorry. for, really. this, was, this was really fun today. Yeah. Well, that's super uh, important. Like Warren, yeah. it's a very different place than I knew. Yeah, it's just <laughs> tucked away a little, right. it's much richer of, this, of the state, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yep. We'll, we'll put you on the hidden places in Warren map. <laughs> no longer hidden. <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe she smells my, my kitty. <laughs>